Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, uh, which has been in virtual mode since the lockdown. We've done about 100 videos so far on the kinds of topics that we used to cover in the real world. A major part of the work that we've been doing has been in the fintech area. We run a monthly fintech for breakfast meeting, or we have done for the last two or three years. Uh, that attracts a number of people who uh, cover the whole ground of what uh, fintech is up to. Uh, but one of the questions that always comes up is what is happening in China? China is really important. China is probably the most important single player in the uh, fintech world, and we don't really understand very much about it. So we're delighted that uh, today we're able to bring to you three experts in the, uh, the fintech field, all of whom have direct experience of China. Our kickoff speaker is Yi Huang, who is a uh, associate professor in international economics and uh, at the at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. He's also the PICTE chair in finance and development there. And he is currently, and I'm delighted to say currently in Shanghai, where he is a fellow at a research institute there. He's also a research affiliate at the Center for Economic Policy Research, a visiting research fellow at the Hong Kong Institute for Economic Policy Research. Uh, and recently was a visiting fellow at the BIS, where he conducted a uh, led a, a study of Chinese fintech. He was formerly an economist at the IMF and a research associate at the Dallas Fed. On his website, he says that he is fond of cheese and wine, which puts paid to the myth that Chinese are lactose intolerant. Our second speaker is Yasim Regrahi. Uh, whose website defines himself as a fintech and China expert. He splits his time currently between Deloitte in Paris and the Alibaba Business School, where he's a certified uh, fintech expert. He spent four years with Alipay and Alibaba in Huangzhou and two years at Y Creations in Shanghai. And our batting cleanup is Anna Hu, uh, who is the CEO and founder of GlobePay and here in London, GlobePay Limited, it sounds a little bit like WorldPay, uh, which he, she says is an official partner of Alipay and WeChat Pay. Before that, she founded, she was the founder of StarPay, StarPay, Glo Starpay Global. She's come down from the stars uh, to, uh, to the globe, and next time, I assume, it will be One Nation, One National, uh, center. Uh, she offers, she says, she offers Chinese payment, a Chinese payment network to UK businesses. So the running order is Yi first, uh, Yasin second, and Anna Batting cleanup. I give you uh, Yi Huang. Thank you very much for kind introductions. And uh, my name is Yi Huang. Uh, uh, good morning, London. And uh, let me try to share my slide. Okay, very good. So my name is Yi Huang, that's a, that's a kind of introduction. I'm a professor at the Geneva, and also the reason I'm in China right now, I'm a Loja Academia Fellows. Loja Academia is a founder research, research institution under Alibaba Group. That's why I'm working very closely with director Long Chen, try to understand how Chinese FinTech grew up and what's the effect to the human beings. Okay, what's the social impact, what's the economic impact. So today my talk only have a 10 minutes. As academia, I would like to follow three steps. Left hand side, right hand side, invisible hand side. So first, firstly, I will try to give us a, a broad pictures and position about Chinese think tank around the world. Based on my recent report at the BIS. Last year, I was a BIS fellows, Bank of International Settlement in Basel. So I'm working with a team uh, led by Yong Xing, we try to understand what happened to the fintech, especially big tech provide f credit doing finance across the world. Then I'm zooming to China. I will try to introduce the Chinese market. What kind of a player and what kind of business they're doing. Finally, again, <laughs> I, I just finished my teaching for fintech and digital economy. I try to summarize what's new compared to fintech, especially fintech landings, fintech doing a uh, tech firm to finance compared with traditional banking service. Okay, let me start. Is that clear? Yep, that's clear. We'll okay, very good. We may cut in if we don't understand. Okay. <laughs> okay, very good. Ask me any questions. 
feel free, please. So as we know, so it's very interesting after 2013, it's coming from my report, BI's report with Yongxin. We look at globally from 2013, 2017, massive increasing from left-hand side to the right-hand side, increasing in terms of FinTech landings, okay? The blue bars, the blue bars are so-called big tech, something like Amazon, Alibaba Group, Yahoo, Facebook, to provide credit compared to traditional FinTech landings. Overall, start from ground at 2013, increasing dramatically by end of 2017. Overall, globally, based on our data set organized from uh, Cambridge University, more than 600 billion FinTech credit provided online. So that's why BIS or a lot of academia try to understand why, what's going on? So why, you know, a lot of tech firm provide credit to the customers. So this is a motivation for our study to understand the just massive tell, increasing. Just tell us, in this big credit, in this big tech credit, who are the, Ch the Chinese players? We know all about next Amazon slide. and so on and so forth. Okay. I'm interested in who the Chinese Next slide, players. next slide. I'm going to zoom. next slide. Okay. The second slide, I try to show the size. Okay, I compare the tech company and the financial company. If you look at the left-hand panels, all the tech company buy market capitalizations. Okay, you have Amazon, Google, Apple, Facebook. Then we have uh, Alibaba Group, Tencent, Baidu. It's the biggest, three biggest player in China in our FinTech. Okay, in terms of market, because all of the three already list. That's why we know the information about market capitalizations. But in the right-hand side, if you look at financial firms, okay, tech firm, virus financial firm, left-hand panels, we have a JP Morgan, we have ICBC, Bank of uh, America, White, Spargo, CCB, HBC, plus our financial, now called Ant Group, okay? So you have so, ICBC, China Commercial Bank, and Ant Group in the top yes. seven. Yes, Three into a financial group. Seven. Yes, in, in terms of financial group. But I want to show, today my talk mainly try to answer questions. Why and how a tech company like uh, Alibaba Group, Amazon provide financial service? This is a key question I'm going to ask and I'm going to zoom into China as a case, okay? So firstly, they're bigger. Tech company that provide financial service, they're biggest. The biggest them into market capitalization, biggest them the financial, financial firms, okay? The key component of them, they are very easy to access customer data, okay? Through their technologies. So second, certainly it's very interesting to see, look at GDP per capita overall. If you look at every single country, big tech, FinTech, if you look at overall, if you look at China side, if I can zoom in third part is China side, 372, which means China FinTech landing per capita, okay? is more than $372. If I look at UK, 110, Thanks all the people in, in UK provide FinTech landings and US only 126. It's a lot of variation across the world, okay? So we try to understand why. So let me give one of the reasons about why. So-called payment, which is uh, now next speaker going to emphasize. If you look at mobile phone payment, okay? Around the world, if you look at uh, Mobile payment annually over GDP from U U uh, US 0 0.6, India 0 0.5, Brazil 0 0.3, Indonesia 0 0.1, UK even smaller. If you look at China annually in terms of a mobile phone payment system or uh, volumes over GDP is more than 16%. It's much, much higher than the rest of the world. So for the next part of my presentation, I'm zooming to China. I'm trying to explain why payment system matters. Payment system is a key to generate acquisition, uh, acquire all the information, different information, high, uh, high frequency information, on time information, which traditional banking service cannot provide. So let me put as a big picture background information. Let me zoom into China. So second reason, why China? So China have a very interesting phenomenon in terms of why FinTech land is so high, so I, based on my recent work, you look at uh, all the Chinese bank branch across all Chinese regions in 2014. Okay, later I will explain why. 2014 is the year 
fintech lending based on our, uh, our financial study, they started 2014. So into the end of 2014, if you look at the traditional Chinese banking branch across China, the darker is higher. If you look at all coast area, a lot of bank branch. But if you look at inland China, remote area, rural area, we lack of financial service. Chinese credit market is very segmented. Local bank usually serve local firms. Local bank usually serve big firms. A lot of unbanking populations in China. This is a niche market, which FinTech get into the ground. Okay, let me start with, at the beginning, initial status, our financial start to lending business start 2014. If you look at traditional banking, all across China, bank branch concentration mainly in the coast area, rich area, and a lot of unbanking population inland China, remote area, uh, no, rural area. That's why FinTech, FinTech companies start to provide credit. This is demand there. This is a niche market, they need credit. They need financial service, but they cannot make it. The key component I will ask for, information symmetry, lot of credit risk. Secondly, they lack of a collateral. They don't have a piece of land. They don't have, they don't have cars. They cannot use collateral to borrow from banks. It's both very important institutional settings. Secondly, based on my recent journal finance papers, we'll look at the Chinese lending rate, shadow rate virus policy rate. In the top black line, top black line measure, the shadow rate, the market rate compared to policy rate. It's a huge spread, okay? Price difference between policy rate, which you can lend to normal people, or lend to the big firms, state companies, compared to normal people. So if you want to borrow money, on one hand, you cannot borrow because, you know, the bank usually cannot, don't want to serve small, medium firms, consumers, younger people. Secondly, even if you want to borrow money from the banks, if you're small people, small guys, small, medium firms, you don't have any collateral, bank is going to charge you higher in terms of lending rate. Okay? These, two, these are two important institutional factors. Why China, the fintech business getting to too fast, much more higher than the rest of the world. So now is the juicy part. Who are they? What are they doing? Let me explain. It's a major player. If we look at the left-hand part, it's a small circle. In the center, we call technology frontier, financial technologies, okay? So called A, B, C, D. A, AI. B, blockchain. C, cloud computing. D, big data, okay? So, all this ABCD around technology frontiers goes through all kinds of what we call scenario in terms of finance. Number one, in the top right, uh, top right hand side is loan. Lending to small business people. Lending to the customer who cannot have a credit cards. It's very different than US. Chinese credit card coverage is less than 30%. Okay, in US we know more than 90%. So most of Chinese uh, normal people, young people don't have credit card. Consumer financing, a huge market boom in China. Second, in left, slide right hand side is wealth management. Then you have credit management, uh, credit management, credit reference. Most of Chinese people don't have credit score. Okay. Then you have digital ticket, payment, uh, supply chain finance, and all other we call scenario around so A, B, C, D named FinTech Technologies, okay? If you look at the right hand panels, those are major player start from financing. Besides our financial, besides WeChat Pays, we do have a traditional banking service. They do invest a lot into tech, uh, FinTech Technologies, okay? Including ICB te Technology, you know, all the major banks, CCBs, they invest a lot in terms of, fin you know, FinTech Technologies. Okay, finance technology. Secondly, payment systems. Also massive third party payment in China. Then you have loans, all kinds of loans provide consumer finance. So-called, you know, uh, people, uh, people, uh, P2P lendings. A lot of people already died, okay? For small credit cards and provide uh, consumer finance. Then you have wealth management. 
and huge because of uh, China have a huge saving countries. Households have to put money into traditional banks. So interest rate very low. So they're looking for the high return, high yield in terms of wealth management products. That's why a lot of fintech company provide so-called wealth management products. The finally, I think a lot of people will talk, including myself. I did a lot of research, uh, use uh, the data from my banks, uh, we banks, and uh, new banks. So my banks is a bank uh, by was uh, funding by Our Financial. Uh, uh, on the group, not called on the group. We banks is, is, is you know is funding by WeChat, and new banks are financed by uh, New Hope Group. So through the our financiers, our uh, uh, sorry, our uh, 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 on the group mainly e-commerce, WeChat mainly social medias, and then New Hope new banks based on supply chain finance. Okay, different kind of a business line use finance technologies, big data, AI, blockchain, clouding, uh, compu uh, cloud computings, okay? They provide financial service. Those are the people in the market. In terms of uh, landings, payments, wealth management, and the consumer finance. Okay, those are the big picture what happened in China right now. Then the business model is very simple. In the right hand side, uh, in, in the left hand side, it's a funding side for the bank, the trust, all the finance leasing firms, consumer finance. The key is in the centers, all the financial industry. They provide the software, data, uh, they collect the data, they provide the assistance to loan or join the loans. But key questions, where's information coming from? Information coming from the right hand side, e-commerce, social medias. Okay, all kinds of information we cannot be provided by children banks. So three sectors be put together, finance, finance uh, fundings, financial in the, uh, fintech technologies, and the information. So now you see all the valuation by different kind of uh, group of people. But in the end, if you're interested, I'll go back to explain why some companies have high valuation compared to other companies. Okay, finally, I think very important to summarize why fintech in China grows very fast. What's different between FinTech are trading bankings. Number one, information advantage. They know all the past information about sales performance, service qualities. They know all the information about credit history and no credit, you know, or how you use the money or personal characteristic. Okay? Because platforms, they, they use very cheap distribution channels to make tailor made it, okay, lending to the people. Okay? And plus, they don't have any loan officers. They use the big data algorithms to provide credit, okay? As I know, we can explain later why information is a new collateral, but uh, let me finish the last part. So, FinTech company compared to children banks, they have inter information advantage. They have, they have very cheap digital channels. Why is it better? Because they can provide, they can easily identify the good borrower, okay, through e-commerce platforms. And that's all the information they're gonna have, big data, not only sales history, also business condition through supply chain, also credit quality, service qualities, and more importantly, more importantly, the delinquency default rate is so low for all these fintech companies in China, except P2P. Because if they default within the platforms, because reputation a new form of collateral, they might lose all the access to the bank, uh, to the credit. Okay, your activities within platforms are valuable collateral. Okay, finally, what's new, what happens? Can we sustain or not? Later we can discuss why they do better because more da better data or better you know, credit risk models. Or can, can this kind of a FinTech credit, FinTech business can replicate in other countries? Can, can they su sustain or not? We can discuss later, but more que the key, last question is, if they compete massively in terms of information advantage, cheap, very cheap to different channel, very low default rate compared to traditional bankings, which is which which sectors they're fighting with? Number one, consumer finance. Number two, small business loans. Luckily, recently I went to another traditional banks and I found out they face the competition, they do something new. This last two slides. If we go to traditional Chinese banks, now you have AI based, robot based, a smart cash ATM. ATM is going to disappear in China, but you need a smart ATM, FinTech based ATM, because 
When you go to the banks, we see a mirror. I don't have any Chinese bank accounts. So they're going to give me provide my credit line. So they can connect all my information in one second. So now I'm entitled 200, 203,000 yuan when I get into the banks before I have a bank account. That's uh, messy. <laughs> thank you. Okay, look, thank you. Um, there are lots and lots of questions that that raises, uh, but one of the issues is obviously why China has got so far ahead on all of these counts uh, than, than, say, France, for instance, or the UK, or even the UK. Uh, what, what has specifically uh, changed in China that makes it receptive to these things? Yassine has spent six years in China. Yassine, tell us, uh, tell, tell us what you think about uh, the the uniqueness of the Chinese situation. Yasin Regahi. Sure. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Leighton, also for the invitation. I'm really glad to join this uh, webinar. And really interesting sharing from uh, Huang. Uh, uh, so actually, I just probably tell you some story about uh, my experience in China. Uh, I've spent six years there, and I didn't even need to use my bank card or my cash. So everything went through. Uh, either Alipay app from Alibaba or WeChat from, from Tencent. Uh, what I can say about it is that actually, if I take the first example of Alipay, uh, the thing of, like the unique thing about it is that it started as an escrow service, uh, like to guarantee trust between uh, buyers and sellers on Alibaba platforms. And then it became an app by the time. So it became super app because there was that trust. And I think that booming of fintech in China is mainly due to the unbanked people uh, and the really like strong strategy that is adopting Ant Group uh, and all the other uh, fintech payers are inclusive strategy to allow all the unbanked people to have access to financial services. Because today there are over 2 billion people uh, in the world who don't have access to financial services uh, who don't have a bank account, etc. So uh, having this kind of disruptive solutions uh, using like technology can definitely uh, offer a new experience. There is a, another thing about China that is really specific. And uh, um, actually it's about TechFin. It was also mentioned by Huang uh, previously. And actually TechFin was the first time pronounced by Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba. Uh, to say that actually it's really different from fintech because um, it's um, it's using technology. It's like a technology company that is offering financial services, and it's not a, a financial company that is using technology uh, compared to, to fintech. Uh, some of the big uh, tech fin players we can take, of course, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, etc. But we can also compare it with the in, in the West with the, with Uber, with the Google, with Facebook, etc. That also are offering uh, financial services. Uh, and the big innovation on that is that tech fin have access to data more than anyone else, more than banks, uh, because actually they have offered a unique experience for the users that allow them to have a value. And they have that value because they gave their data. Uh, so in general, I have a lot of conversations with people in France and in Europe in general. They are really uh, uh, worried about this usage of data. Uh, but actually, I, I, I see it as uh, like uh, China is really unique because uh, it's basically using uh, like the, the power of value to guarantee that the data is not used uh, on uh, different ways that offer a value for something. For example, uh, during the 11-11 shopping festival in China or during the uh, Chinese New Year, etc., there are massive discounts and massive uh, uh, promotions, etc., that of course force people to uh, provide more data to, to, to use those services. And I'm certain that here in France, more and more companies are uh, doing the same because uh, people today that are using Facebook, they're using Google, they're using Uber, they're using all these uh, top tech players, they are giving data to them. Uh, but they unconsciously give their data, but they say, no, we have to protect them. So I really want to mention data because it's the core model of tech company. Uh, and it's also something particular in China because the approach is really different. 
and what we can say also about China is that uh, there are two big players, of course, that are uh, Ant Group and, and Tencent. Uh, there are also new players like Union Pay is going to launch an, an app as well. Uh, there are, of course, other uh, fintech solutions that are also going to, to be launched. Uh, so I'm really interested to see how the, the future of fintech will be in China and the, and the rest of the world. And the upcoming Ant Group uh, IPO will also be really, uh, uh, really interesting for the rest of the world because the ambition of, of Ant Group and all the tech players is to go global uh, and to target, of course, the, the develop, underdeveloped countries or developing countries. So if you're stopping there, let me ask you, you obviously haven't, um, nobody, neither you nor Yi Huang has, uh, has mentioned the social credit system in in China. This is, if you like, the downside of data, is it not? Uh, Yasin. Well, no, because um, actually, uh, let's, let's take it this way. Um, in, in China, we have like uh, different scores offered by this fintech, either uh, WeChat or, or, or uh, Alipay. Uh, on WeChat, it's uh, the WeChat Pay score. Uh, on Alipay, it's Gemma score, Sesame score, credit. Uh, these scores are based not only on financial statements, but also based on the behavior on the apps. Uh, and it offers something more for the users. For example, I can, uh, I can get, a, for example, a, a, a power bank or a bike, I can rent a bike without giving a deposit because I have this really interesting score. And what we don't really know in the West is that these tech companies, uh, for example, Uber, is also using scoring. Uh, when you take an Uber ride, uh, you score your driver, the driver scores you. Uh, Uber gets data, of course, uh, of... Uh, like uh, mobility of transportation, etc. But they also get data of food because you you order from uh, Uber Eats. Uber launched their fintech called Uber Money, so they also have financial information. At the end, we see that this score also offers some unique service because if I have a higher score than you, definitely I will uh, get a, a car faster than you. So this score is not really specific to China. Uh, it's just that it's, uh, it was less regulated, as we see in the Europe with the GP, GDPR, uh, but it's going more and more regulated. So Gemma Credit in China was the first one who, who got the license from the from Chinese government to uh, be able to offer this score. Uh, and of course, it's extremely regulated. Uh, and the information of users are not used like randomly and it's really protected. Even myself, when I was working for Alibaba, I never had access to any like uh, real information of users. It was only like um, like data that helped me to take decisions on my uh, like daily operations, etc. It was not uh, like private information. So we really have to be conscious about that. Uh, and then, um, if I take the the this like specificity of Europe. Um, I think it's what makes Europe really unique is that it's really protecting users. Uh, but users today are able and they accept to offer more and more their data. And we see it from the latest Deloitte report that uh, explains that, for example, in France, uh, people are able uh, to share their data with more and more people, more and more companies. And 16 million French people among uh, 67 million uh, have shared their personal data with non-banking companies, which proves that there is really uh, a big move and a trust that is really gained. I mentioned before about Alipay as an escrow service and became really a trust partner for, for their users. It's the same thing that is happening in the rest of the world. As long as I trust a platform, I will be able to share data and it will offer me a, a service that I like. Okay, well, let's bring in, let's bring in Anna, because uh, everybody is talking about payments. You actually have set up two companies in this space. How do you see it? And I don't know if, if Yi, Yi Huang could uh, possibly come back on screen. Um, you, I think you've killed your I'm video. Here, I'm here. There yeah. we are. There you are. Anna, tell us, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with GlobePay, but more important, how you see the payments situation in China. I give you Anna Hu. 
Okay, great. And uh, firstly, thank you for the invitation, Andrew. And uh, it's really useful to learn something from Yi Huang and uh, Yasin. And maybe my experience is more practical, practical based. Maybe better for me to explain what, what's Global Pay Do in the UK. And we are a payment institution regulated by FCA. And uh, as a fintech startup, we only operate in two years. And uh, our service is try to we aggregate all the top 10 Chinese payment gateway into one single API. And uh, as for the UK company or European company, as long as they do business with China or global Chinese consumers, as long as they integrate our single API, then they can access the most popular China payment solutions, such as WeChat Pay, Alipay, ePay, UnionPay, Lakala, the most uh, top payment solutions, actually. Uh, our mission is to break the uh, payment limitation between global Chinese and uh, European companies. Because uh, from my experience, the cross border still be a headache for the UK company before. And uh, no matter the efficiency or the transaction fee or the cost, but however, the new innovation way will be lower down the transaction fee compared with SWIFT. And however, it is still increasing the efficiency. For example, as from our solution, we can do like a T plus one or T plus two days for the cross-border settlement. And uh, 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 through the payment technology, and uh, we primarily focus to bridge the gap between business in the UK and 1.4 billion Chinese consumers through our bodiless payment technology. And our team have experience both in China payment industry, also in the UK uh, payment industry. But however, as for the challenge we're facing is the regulation. Actually, as for UK regulation and the China regulation, it's really different, especially for, uh, uh, especially for compliance, merchants onboarding, and uh, you know, in UK, maybe we can get a uh, clear guidance for uh, from FCA for how to run a financial firm properly. But however, I believe in China end, we have to do a lot of research and maybe to to talk to our partners to understand how to meet the local regulation in China. And as you know, China have like a foreign currency control policy, and. Uh, uh, as for the second challenge we're facing is like uh, maybe the technical, because we put our technical guy based in China. And, uh, uh, but however, uh, maybe the, the time gap uh, or the still be some regulation based. Because in the UK, they quite focus on anti money laundry and especially for your system to make sure the payment can be secure and uh, you have to do transaction monitor, uh, all the all the infrastructure to meet their higher standard. So in, in China, I think maybe this two gap is quite a, a different between China and the UK. Um, but however, I believe um, mobile, mobile payment or cashless society will be the future, definitely. And during this COVID-19 COVID and uh, however, a lot of company has been encountered a lot of difficulty during this challenging time, especially for some traditional business. And, uh, but however, as for FinTech, especially for online payment, uh, we see a booming during recently three months. But from beginning, we do quite well. And from beginning the company setup until now, we still maintain a 20 up to 30% increase in rate per month. So, but however, during this challenge time, it seems like we up to 50% increasing rate per month. And we see uh, there will be a, a bigger opportunity uh, in the future. And another new thing came out from China is the digital yuan. Because China is going to uh, replace all the physical cash in the future, and all the physical cash will be totally exchanged to digital yuan. And I believe this is a huge revolution for the financial industry in China. Uh, maybe still can be a little bit uh, impact uh, the China mobile payment uh, giant like uh, WeChat Pay, Alipay. Because digital yuan, maybe there's no big difference uh, when you're shopping something through digital yuan or mobile wallet. But however, the big difference is 
If you're shopping in a shop in China, if you want to pay through WeChat or Alipay, maybe the merchants can refuse. For example, I, if I don't provide WeChat or Alipay, and maybe I can let you know, okay, I can't accept WeChat or Alipay. But however, digital yuan is very different from mobile wallet because they replace the China uh, physical cash. It means the digital yuan will be have a legal position, same as physical cash. If you walk into the shop and if you want to shop in something, use digital yuan. The merchants couldn't uh, refuse it because that is like a legal currency. If you refuse it, it means you're against the law. So from this scenario, uh, it means cashless society definitely will happen in the future from my experience. But however, um, still be a kind of um, influence for mobile wallet. Yeah. Okay, well, let's let me ask, let's open this up. But let me ask my colleague Leighton Hughes, who is our tech expert, in house tech expert, what, what are the, the big issues as far as you're concerned when it comes to Chinese fintech? Leighton, Leighton Hughes. So, um, yeah, the, the, the first thing that um, th there was just one particular area that I'm, I'm, really, folk, I'm really interested in, and that's, um, you know, for every 40,000. Startups, uh, there is a, only one makes it in China. Such is the level of competition I've read. Um, but I, I was just uh, thinking, you know, is is this? Um, and this may be an awkward question, but how much has the the country sort of rigged its market to, um, you know, to prevent foreign players from competing in sectors? And um, if that didn't exist, so in terms of tech uh, capture and uh, you know forcing hand handing uh, tech tech over to local partners would is, is that um, would the landscape be much different or is is the competition so intense uh, intensive that uh, they I mean I, I know that e eBay got wiped out of the uh, blown out of the water when it tried to compete with Alibaba uh, you need hey, there are two, two questions there. One, the, to, about the competitiveness of the industry. I had no idea that that is the ratio. 40,000 failures to one success defines success. I don't know how you define success. But the other thing, have the Chinese authorities tilted the playing field in favor of domestic companies against foreign companies, as the Americans say, and I guess probably as the Europeans also say? Let me ask Yi first, Yi Huang. Okay, thank you very much. Again, I'm an academia, I'm an economist, I'm not a political scientist, but I cannot provide my very narrow-minded footnotes. Number one, demand. So in China, they have a lot, huge underbanking, underbank service demand to desperate want the finance service. So the reason we have a very good online ease of finance or e-commerce, social media, because we have a relatively poor okay, offline, Business, okay? Secondly, very interesting, I think, even if foreign firm get in China, even the same Chinese get into the, to Switzerland, I always ask myself, why Switzerland don't have good e-commerce, don't have a good uh, fintech company? As we mentioned, fintech coming from three parts. Part number one, funding side, which is easy for Swiss. Number two, technology, also easy for Swiss. More important information. Information coming from where? Information coming from payments, social medias, or supply chain use. And if you look at the Swiss average wage, it's so expensive. Look at delivery, look at transportation, logistic. It's very hard for foreign firms to operation, to compete in China globally. Even foreign firms get in China, what's problems? What's, I feel they lack of competitive advantage in terms of information, gathering, through the market. Again, economics will always say network, plus dependence. Once you have millions of billions of customers, you are trying very hard to keep a customer, so the customer attention, customer royalty, customer capitals. Secondly, it's very hard to switch a customer. So even now, any foreign company, I'm sorry, even my Swiss friend want to get in China, even have a huge good technology. More important, I learned from market, demand matters. Tailor-made matters, price, the cost. 
Okay, so a lot of things we can discuss rather than very, you know, sufficient only talk about the propaganda stuff. Let's go to the detail into academic research. You know how many loan officers in uh, within one, uh, uh, within one fintech, biggest fintech banks, we banks. Oh, sorry, my bank. My bank only have a 333 staffs, including receptions, human resource. You know, technology change China, not only China, look at Kenya, look at all the world, around the world. Once you have a very poor offline financial service, one technology can adoptions. What's called FinTech? FinTech's finance technology, financial technology adoptions. Some adoptions is by push. So adoption by demand on China is very different. We cannot compare apple to orange. I'm sorry. So is that, I would do you say. agree, uh, Yassin? That's a, a, a rather negative picture as far I, as foreign investors in China is concerned. I definitely agree, uh, uh, Andrew. And, uh, and I think that uh, Juan is really right on the fact that uh, uh, the FinTech is uh, developed, the most developed in the uh, countries where um, where the financial system are the less developed. Basically, uh, he gave the example of, of Kenya, but I can also see in Southeast Asia, for example, India, PTM uh, today has 150 million, more than 150 million users. Uh, we can see uh, in like Pakistan, we can see it in uh, uh, like Indonesia, in Malaysia, etc. All these countries see a boom in fintech because uh, there, there is a huge population that is unbanked. Uh, and that's where and these countries actually um, are, are a target for uh, Ant Group, for example, and for Tencent as well, because they have investments there, they have partnerships there, uh, and they see a potential because uh, why we say that it's easier to develop there? Because first, there is no regulations or regulations are really not as strong as developed countries. And then there are the banks, uh, uh, like offer, of course, uh, solutions and um, really products like, uh, or services, financial services, but they are not innovative. So FinTech are here to offer a really unique solution and really interesting solution and innovative solution for the unbanked people as well. So only with a phone number, you can, uh, you can create an account. And of course you need your ID as well. Uh, so we we are not anymore in the process of uh, of a European bank or French bank where you have a really long process to register, etc. Now uh, even European uh, firms and and banks aim to offer a really fast KYC process uh, because they see that users prefer to open uh, like a challenger bank account or open a fintech. Uh, account rather than go in, in a bank to open that account because they are offering really innovative solutions. And it's really easier to open uh, in, in like develop, I mean, developing countries. Uh, okay, that, that, put, that puts European uh, companies and American companies, even the big tech American companies, at a serious disadvantage when they try to compete in China or indeed in third countries. I, does this mean effectively that the Chinese market is going to be closed to the Amazons and Googles as they try to move into financial services? Yes. Well, because, because if we see uh, China today, geographically speaking, they are closer to, uh, I mean, they're in Asia, so they are closer to all the developing countries uh, in, in Southeast Asia. So it's easier for them. Uh, and culturally speaking, it's easier rather than Europe and, and the US. So they, of course, uh, gain a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, advantage there, and they, they are present for a few years already, uh, where, of course, uh, we have the European and the American who are either not present or have their presence really, really small. And we see it also on the amount of foundings. that is huge. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there were some reports that show that it's over uh, a billion or or two billion US dollars that have been invested uh, in, in, in some countries only for fintech. So, which is quite a, a lot comparing to, uh, to what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, there, is, there is another part, I think in, in case we want to understand 
uh, the fintech today, we need to see also India. Because India is really the example of China maybe 10 or 20 years ago where the mobile payment was not really developed and uh, where, of course, it's, it's now booming. Anyone now can open a, a, a Paytm account and, uh, and pay on like a convenience store or uh, either like a shop which is on the street. So I believe that uh, fintech, we will see more and more fintech companies developing in, in those like coming countries and Africa also. We need to see that, to look at Africa because uh, Africa has, a, I think it's the continent that has the most unbanked uh, population. And, right, but uh, it's also on China's Belt and Road Initiative, and uh, the Chinese have a presence in Africa, which again, uh, on the whole, Western uh, financial institutions don't have, or they are in retreat because of KYC and all sorts of other issues. Can I ask Anna, uh, longer term, China it, uh, has effectively done away with cash, is that correct? And the government is thinking of a digital cash solution. Uh, do you think that that's um, is, is that uh, is that really going to happen? I mean, is the central bank digital cash initiative real in China? Um, I believe so. Uh, the I think there's uh, several reasons. The first one is like uh, uh, car um, digital currency has been existing several years and through blockchain technology, and the blockchain technology. From beginning, from beginning until now, uh, it's really have uh, speed up uh, the money and the decentralization can be maybe can be a potential risk for both countries' government, same as China. But however, if China can issue digital currency, replace all the physical cash, maybe better for um, maybe better to control all the uh, all the physical cash. And uh, however, still can lower down the cost of for uh, produce the paper cash, and uh, still a good opportunity to build a uh, uh, Chinese credit uh, structure. Because in China, I believe credit uh, still be an issue for the government uh, to government to try to lower down the risk uh, for in in the financial industry. But however. It is totally different from UK and China. UK have a proper credit uh, structure fundamentally, but in China, if, if they are working on that, improve, improving the, the credit control. But however, if uh, currency can be digitalized, maybe a good way to, to can lower down the money laundry risk, uh, corruption risk, uh, and still can good to help people to build their credit scores. Uh, it should be take ages, but uh, it seems um, during this special time, especially American and China and uh, American dollars still lead the whole market, still lead the whole international trading business. So I believe digitalization for Chinese yuan will be happen yeah, in, the, in the future. Maybe uh, there'll be a huge revolution. Can, yeah. can I ask Yi Kuang the same question? Though? I mean, how, how realistic is it for China entirely to do away with cash, to go to digital cash at a, an official level. I mean, how close is it to, to, to doing away with cash? Okay, based on my reading, my newspaper, everything, like everybody, I think Central PBOC tried very hard try to launch this kind of a central bank digital currency through two layers. Firstly, they give some credit, it's a digital currency to the commercial banks, and commercial bank give to the customers. But mainly, I guess, my guess, they will become a money, have the same like a normal cash. The problem is mainly give to customer rather than company. Let me explain why. Because nowadays major transaction through e-commerce social media platforms based on customers with consumers rather than a company produce uh, water. I don't think they will use all this kind of a uh, digital money. M what's money? Money have different function. As we teach students, you need for a uh, unit for accounting, everything. So, I think for consumer side, yes, but for company, for big financial institution, no. From my understanding, as an academic perspective. 
Yasin, you said you were essentially six years in China and never used cash. Yes, that, exactly. Um, China is so far ahead of everyone else in getting rid of cash. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I think there are other countries uh, which are following this way as well. We see it in Europe with uh, like uh, Sweden that also has a, a cash usage under 4%. Uh, but of course, the population is not as big as as uh, China. And uh, if we take it of the scale of China, of course, uh, uh, me and even my friends didn't need to use cash, and all the operations go through Alipay or WeChat because uh, these apps are not only payment apps; they are what we call lifestyle apps because they are offering uh, lifestyle services. For example, I can talk with my friends, I can pay my bills. Uh, I can buy a, a train ticket, uh, I can book a hotel room, uh, and I can do everything with this app. So basically, I don't need uh, to have cash anytime or anywhere. Uh, and even when I went uh, like for hiking in a mountain uh, in a very far place in, in China, uh, I could find a, like a store uh, selling water and having a QR code of, of WeChat or Alipay so I could pay there. Uh, and today, I think everyone is accepting this. And also with the digital currency that is uh, coming soon, uh, I think it will also uh, be accept, accepted in, in most of the country as well. Okay, a final question to, to all of you. Put yourselves two or three years ahead into the future. Chinese fintech dominates the world or it runs up against a kind of glass ceiling as to how far it can actually expand? Let me ask Anna first. What are, over the next two, three years are you looking for as developments? Can Chinese fintech continue its remorseless rise in both in China and in Southeast Asia and Asia more generally and perhaps through the BRI through the rest of the world? Would you punt on it? Mm, I think uh, in several years, China... I'm not too sure China will be dominant the whole financial industry globally, but it seems uh, China still be still uh, walking in front of others, and especially for new technology. And no matter for digital currency or 5G, I believe these two huge technology will be a revolution for the whole financial industry in China. Actually, as for other countries like European and the and US, maybe still far behind 5G and slow down to do the development. But in China and 5G still be a huge change for all the network and the technology supporting, no matter for the speed, for the cost. And it can be do more than more, they can be they can provide more functionalities in fintech industry than before. Same as digital currency, digital yuan. It already start with private testing in Shenzhen uh, at this moment. So I believe if uh, uh, use these two technology and uh, China fintech will be uh, booming quickly and increasing quickly, will be a huge revolution to the whole financial world. And yeah. Yes, yeah, Yes, well, I, I see that China today is definitely the leading uh, country in terms of fintech. Uh, it will still be, I think, in three years, in five years, in 10 years, we don't know, but in five years at least. Uh, because, as I mentioned, Juan, there, is, there are three things. There is a founding, there is a tech, and there is the information, and China has the information. They have the data, and they have the tech as well. And they are investing massively on blockchain, on AI, on cloud, etc. So these technologies are changing the fintech ecosystem. And uh, we have newcomers, of course, in terms of tech fin, like, uh, like Google, Facebook, etc., which are, I think, uh, almost the same size as the Chinese uh, uh, tech fin, but they're not as innovative as them. And they don't have as much data as they do in, in, in China. So, I think China will still be ahead for a while, but we don't know how uh, the future will be because of these uh, trade wars, regulations, etc. So definitely in China, they will be really developed. Uh, even now, when I went to China for the last time, I could see people paying with their face. Uh, it's something we, we cannot see it uh, yet in the West. Uh, so this also proves that there is a big uh, uh, evolution. And I'm sure that uh, in the coming years, 
will be pain with another part of our body or or, or just entering the store, etc. So I think um, definitely China will be ahead, but we need to be careful of the newcomers uh, because there are a lot of innovate innovations around the world. Uh, so let's see how uh, each country will be innovative in terms of fintech. And and you you would put a little a small bet on India, I gather from what you were saying. Well, India definitely. I think India, but there are also other countries uh, like even the US and and in Europe, we have a lot of countries that try to uh, to to launch their own solutions, etc. But they will not be as developed because they don't have that access to data and that uh, ease to use of data. Uh, but I believe that India is definitely a competitor in terms of size of the market, in terms of unbanked population, uh, and also in terms of technology. They have the brains as well. They have the right engineers. Uh, I think they have all the right ingredients uh, to, to be a big competitor. Uh, but let's see how the pol geopolitical uh, situation will uh, develop. So let's see carefully that part. The last word is with you, Li Huan. Where does okay, so... Okay, so as a economics again, I look at demand supply, then we look at competitive advantage. Demand side, China still have a huge internally, lot of regional variations. A lot of people look at Shanghai, Beijing, or coast area. If you look at the middle area, 30th, 40th cities, a huge under banking, under satisfied for uh, cons uh, consumptions, a lot of huge demand still in China. I think within five years, still, Chinese fintech company, it's going to satisfy, going to every single dimensions plus aging problems. If you look at it now, the new generations, I just went to the Alpha Net, uh, I went to Alibaba uh, last week, asked the people how you design your products, how do you provide a service? So look, you have to understand that this kind of new generations, this cause zero, zero, post zero, zero, abroad, when you're born after 2000, they have a different view about foreign products and domestic products. It's number one. Number two, supply. China, indeed, if you look at uh, science, computer scientists, engineering, put populations. Again, China, India, if a big population, they have a better pool in terms of engineering. Also, a very interesting phenomenon. I was uh, recently went to a primary school, middle school. You know, the students start to, middle school kids start to learn Python such AI, of course, option. So these things, nobody can stop. In terms of big populations, population means more supply in terms of engineering. Population means more information. Last but not least, competitive advantage. I think you have, a, you have a, you, we have to differentiate China and the Chinese abroad. So a lot of Chinese live abroad. So if you want to ask me whether you see China FinTech business, it could extend to abroad. Yes, because we have a lot of overseas Chinese populations. But my bottom line is, fintech industry is booming in China. It's not because of a political reason, from my observations, mainly from demand and answer the demand. And the one technology can help those people, have, they expect better service, better consume. Remember, saving China saving rate is so high. It's, more, it's top in the world. So that's why I can see in the end, bottom line, China's fintech company, fintech industry will satisfy every single corner in China, every single generation, and uh, I'm looking forward. <laughs> On that happy note, can I bring this to a close? We've run over. I apologize for that, but this, this is a big issue, and even an hour isn't enough to cover it. Can I thank Yi Huang, from, who currently is in Shanghai, Yasin Regrahi, who is currently in Paris, and Anna Hu, who is currently in London, and my colleague Leighton Hughes. Many, many thanks also to you who've been watching.